we're now going to turn our attention to the physical applications of the calculus of variations. And what we find is that the calculus of variations, really more than any other branch of mathematics, is intimately connected with the physical world in which we live. And the reason for that is because nature favors extremum principles. And these are just tailor-made for the calculus of variations in order to provide that mathematical framework for their explanation and solution. And we experienced some hints of this in chapter one where we saw that many of the laws of physics find their most natural mathematical expression in the calculus of variations. So we looked at Fermat's principle of optics, we looked at minimization of total energy of a liquid drop. And in both of those cases, the physical principle, which was stated in words, was most naturally expressed mathematically in a variational form. And this is very common. And we're gonna see much more of this in part two of the book. So I want us to see how this wide variety of physical applications can be encapsulated in a single variational principle, Hamilton's principle, which is the focus of this chapter and, and the next several videos. And if you look at the table of contents, you'll see that in part two we treat classical mechanics, which includes dynamics and statics of deformable as well as rigid bodies. It includes fluid mechanics, it includes optics and electromagnetics. It even includes modern physics, relativity, as well as quantum mechanics. So you see there's a wide variety of physical phenomena and then all can be encapsulated with, within this one variational principle. It's really quite astounding and, and a very helpful framework to understand and be able to utilize. So we'll first look at Hamilton's principle applied to discrete systems, then continuous systems. And I'm actually gonna give you Hamilton's principle to start. We'll talk about it, we'll do some examples so we become familiar with it and comfortable with using it. And we'll actually derive it later in chapter four. And we're gonna do that using the first law of thermodynamics, which is an even more fundamental law of physics. And so we'll do that derivation later on, but I think it's helpful to first understand what Hamilton's principle is and how to use it to some extent at least before we derive it. Okay, so let's start with a situation where we have a single order one sized rigid particle. So, let me, so it's one object, I can hold it in my hand, it's order one size. It's rigid, so it's not deformable, I can't squish it and squash it, it's rigid. And it's acted upon by a force vector F, could be a function of T, you'll notice that's a, that's a bold F, so it's a force vector. And then R of T, which is also a vector, that's the position of the object, so we have the force which is given as a function of t that's acting on our object, and r of t is then the dependent variable, that's what we're looking for. So the u in chapter two is now an r, which is the position vector. So here's Hamilton's principle for at that single particle. We're looking for the actual trajectory, r is a function of t, that the system takes. So the path of the single object in some time interval t1 to t2, and Hamilton's principle then asserts that that trajectory, r of t, has to be a stationary function of the following functional. So this is Hamilton's principle. It's the integral over the time interval, t1 to t2, of the variation of capital T, which is the kinetic energy, plus the force vector dotted with delta r, that's the variation of the position vector. This is a dot product of these two vectors. Now you may recognize this as a work type of term, right? Force times a distance is work, and we'll get to that in a moment. So let's just walk through these. This capital T here, that's the kinetic energy. It's one half times mass times the velocity squared, and velocity is the time rate of change of the position. So it's one half m r dot squared. Dots here denote differentiation with respect to time, as is typically the case. So v squared is v dot v, which is r dotted with r dot. All right, now let's take a look at the f dot delta r. So again, that's like a work, it's a force times a distance. It's actually called virtual work, and that's because we have to account for all of the forces acting on the body, whether they actually do work, force times a distance or not. So there's various forms of work that could be done. It could be done due to gravitational potential energy because of the height of the object. It could be due to strain energy, which is a form of energy that re results from deformation. So if you take a spring and you squish the spring, you've imparted strain energy into that spring. It could be because of electrostatic potential, because of charges, and so on. So anything that produces a force that acts on this object could produce work in F dot delta R. So we talk about this virtual work due to a virtual displacement. And the term virtual here, we have to be a little careful because in the modern usage, it has 
a whole bunch of new meanings. You can think of it as a hypothetical or a possible work due to a possible or hypothetical displacement. So the delta R, as you'll see in a moment, is the virtual displacement. Those are the directions that the object could move, whether they actually move in those directions or not. It's the directions that it could move. So they're virtual or hypothetical or possible displacements. And therefore, the virtual work is the work, the force times the distance, that could result from those virtual displacements. So the forces are actual, the actual forces acting on the system, but the displacement, as well as therefore the work, are virtual. They are hypothetical or the possible works that could take place. So just think, for example, I'm standing here on, on the floor. I can't move down. Now you could lift me up, so I could be lifted up. I could be moved side to side, left to right, front to back, but I can't go down. So my virtual displacement would reflect that. It would allow me to, it would take into account the fact that I can move up side to side, but not down. Likewise, the virtual work in the same way. So more specifically then, the virtual displacement is again a hypothetical or a possible displacement that's consistent with the physical constraints on the system that allow for certain motions and disallow other motions. So now let's look at what we did in chapter two. So we have our variational form and let's get the corresponding Euler equation, the differential equation whose solution is the stationary function of our original functional. So what is the Euler equation for Hamilton's principle? Well, let's take a look at this first term, the kinetic energy term. It's the integral over time of the variation of t. And the kinetic energy is 1 half times m times r dot squared. So let's take the variation of that. Now, of course, m is a constant, so that comes outside the integral. And we have the variation of something squared, which as we've seen many times, that's 2 times the something times the variation of the something. The 2 cancels with the 1 half. And we have r dot dotted with delta r. So it's the something times the variation of the something. Because the something is a vector, we have to use a dot product here. And then we use integration by parts. So we want to move the dot, the derivative, off of the delta r and onto the r dot. So when we do the integration by parts, we get minus r double dot dotted with delta r. And then we get this term from the integration by parts that's applied at the beginning and end times. Now we're going to say that the position r is known at the beginning and end times. So just like in chapter 2 where we had u and u hat were the same at both ends of the domain, we're going to say the same thing here, in which case this vanishes. All right, so we just have minus m, don't forget the m, times r double dot dotted with delta r. So now when you put that back in for delta t, we have minus m times r double dot plus f, our force vector, and that is all dotted with delta r. So now notice how similar this is to what we had in chapter two. We have the integral of something with no deltas in it times the variation of the dependent variable has to be equal to zero. According to the fundamental lemma, the calculus of variations, the only way that that can in general be true is if this is equal to zero everywhere. That is the Euler equation. Now that will look familiar. That's Newton's second law. F equals ma, where the acceleration a is the second time derivative of the position r. So Newton's second law then is the Euler equation for Hamilton's variational principle. And the solution r is a function of t of f equals ma, Newton's second law then, will be the stationary function which is the trajectory of that single particle. In fact, many people, when they derive Hamilton's principle, they start with f equals ma, they take that as known and understood and accepted, and then they do the inverse variational problem to get back to Hamilton's principle. I prefer not to do it that way, first of all, because why should I believe Newton's second law? I have nothing against Isaac Newton, but how is that any more fundamental than Hamilton's principle? Or in fact, how is that any more fundamental than the first law of thermodynamics. So I'm going to drive it from the first law of thermodynamics, as you'll see later on. But in fact, Newton's second law is the Euler equation that corresponds to the variational Hamilton's principle. So now we need to discuss different types of forces. So the F of T, they could be conservative forces or non-conservative forces. 
I'll talk about the terminology later on, but let's just talk about conservative versus non-conservative forces. So we'll denote F sub C for conservative, F sub N C for non-conservative. So of the forces acting on our objects, some of them could be conservative, some of them could be non-conservative. Let's just talk about that distinction. So conservative forces, in that case the virtual work done by our conservative forces, we'll call that W sub C to match with the F sub C. And in that case, it is independent of the path. So the work done on the object doesn't depend on the path that it takes from T1 to T2. It only depends on where it started and where it ended. So in other words, the process is reversible. So the work is recoverable. All the work that's been done on the system, you can get that back so that the process is reversible. That's only true if the work done is all converted to either kinetic or potential energy and that's mechanical energy. So mechanical energy is what is being conserved. Not the total energy necessarily, but the mechanical en energy is what's being conserved in this context. So mechanical energy is kinetic energy as well as potential energy. So conservative forces include forces due to gravity, stretching of an elastic spring, deformation of an elastic body, as well as electric forces. Those are all reversible. You can recover the work. You can get the work back that you've done on the object. Now, non-conservative forces are everything's just the opposite. So the virtual work done will be denoted by W sub NC. We go with F sub NC. And in that case, the work is not recoverable because the process is irreversible. So if you try to rewind the system, you're not going to get back all the work that you put into it. It's irreversible. So mechanical energy is not conserved. The total energy certainly is conserved. It has to be. But in the case of non-conservative forces, some of the work gets converted into heat. The mechanical energy is not conserved, although the total energy certainly is, again. Some examples are when you have friction or drag, some form of damping, or deformation of an inelastic body, and magnetic forces. So as you can see, non-conservative forces are in some way associated with dissipation. There's some energy loss because of friction, damping, and so forth. And that is why you lose some of your total mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is not conserved. So why do I bring this up? Well, it turns out that for non-conservative forces, so F sub NC, the only way we can get the virtual work is by performing this dot product, F dot delta R that we had in the original form of Hamilton's principle. However, for conservative forces, we can significantly simplify the F dot delta R, the virtual work term, in the case of these conservative forces. So let's see how that, that goes. The reason why we can do this is because we can express the work as an exact differential of some scalar quantity. For now, we'll just call it capital gamma of R. I don't know what it is yet. We'll see in a moment. So my F dot delta R, we're going to write as delta of gamma. Remember, we saw the delta of the kinetic energy before. So now there's going to be a delta of some other scalar function, gamma, as you'll see. OK, so that's the exact differential. We can express the virtual work as this exact differential, delta, gamma. So then the work done by our conservative forces, which again is always f dot delta r, well, that's just the integral of our delta gamma now. And because it does not depend on path, it only matters what is gamma at the beginning and the ending time, beginning and ending position. So gamma of R2 at T2 minus gamma of R1 at T1. It's that difference that gives us the total work due to the action of that conservative force. We'll see in the next slide how that helps us mathematically. The potential energy V then, we're going to take as the negative of gamma. So this generic scalar function, we know it exists because there is this exact differential that exists, and we're going to call that the negative of the potential energy. Now, why the negative sign? The negative sign is introduced, for example, because gravitational potential energy, which is equal to the work required to raise an object against gravity to its current location, is equal to the negative of the virtual work F dot delta R acting on the body that's required to raise it. A simpler way to think about this is that the force on the object, which for example in the case of gravity is down, is in the direction of decreasing potential. Your potential energy to, due to gravity increases as you increase your height, and that is the opposite of the direction of the force itself.
Okay, so let's see mathematically how this benefits us. So we have that f dot delta r can be expressed as the variation of capital gamma, and capital gamma is going to be the negative of the potential energy, capital V. Now what's the variation of V? Let's use Cartesian coordinates. So V is a function of x, y, and z. So the variation of V would be partial V partial x delta x plus partial V partial y delta y plus partial V partial z delta z. We can also see that the gradient of V, that's partial V partial xi plus partial V partial yj plus partial V partial zk. That's a vector. And then we also have that the virtual displacement delta r in Cartesian vector form would be delta xi plus delta yj plus delta zk. If we take the dot product of these two things right here, well, we just get back the variation of v. So the variation of v can be written as the gradient of v dotted with delta r. And that's what we have here. f dot delta r is equal to the negative of the gradient of v dotted with delta r. So that means the force to the conservative forces, f sub c, is equal to the negative of the gradient of the potential energy V. So that's what we have here. F is the negative of the gradient of V. So the conservative force may be expressed in, as the gradient of a scalar function. So that's the key. That's not possible for non-conservative forces. It's only possible for conservative forces. So now we can combine these together. The total work done by all of the forces, including conservative forces and non-conservative forces, is then minus capital V for the conservative forces, plus for the non-conservative forces, the integral of F dot delta R. So again, for non-conservative forces, we have to do the virtual work in this way, F dot delta R, whereas for conservative forces, we can express them in the form of a potential energy. And we'll do a number of examples, and you'll see how this plays out. Or if you prefer, you can always use f dot delta r, because that applies to all forces. So you, for conservative forces and non-conservative forces, you can use f dot delta r. OK, so let's put this all together. So let's rewrite Hamilton's principle then for the case where we have conservative as well as non-conservative forces. For the non-conservative forces, we have our f dot delta r, and then minus the variation of v for the conservative forces. And then the variation of t, Obviously, that's our kinetic energy. So this is the virtual work term, whether for conservative or non-conservative forces. Now, if you only have conservative forces, then you don't need this term. Then you can write Hamilton's principle for conservative forces in this very concise form. The variation of the integral of L with respect to T is equal to 0. L is called the Lagrangian, after Lagrange. And that's t minus v. That's the t minus v that you see right here. OK, so this is the form that you'll often see. If you look up Hamilton's principle in most books or online, this is the form that you'll generally see. But this only applies to situations with conservative forces. If you have non-conservative forces, then you have to use the f dot delta r. OK, I have a number of comments to help us understand this better. The first, then, is that of all the possible paths, r of t, of all the possible trajectories, that this object could move through space from T1 to T2, the actual path that it takes is the one for which we have a stationary function of Hamilton's principle, the integral of L dt. It's not necessarily a minimum. Sometimes it is, but it doesn't have to be. It only has to be a stationary function. Now, one of the advantages of using Hamilton's variational principle is the fact that it is independent of the coordinate system. So if you think of Newton's second law, think back to a physics class, dynamics class, the first thing when you solve a problem you have to think about is, what is the coordinate system that I'm going to use? That determines the form of Newton's second law, and it determines the forms of the vectors for the forces and positions and so forth. In the case of Hamilton's principle for conservative systems now, everything is in terms of scalars. T and V are scalars. Kinetic and potential energy are scalars. Therefore, the choice of coordinate system that you use is actually one of secondary consideration. It doesn't change the form of Hamilton's principle for conservative forces, and that's a, a big advantage. We'll talk more about that later on. But even philosophically, coordinate systems are purely for our own convenience. It's our choice to represent a particular system in a particular way using a particular coordinate system. There's nothing inherently physical about that coordinate system. We use those for communication, for our purposes. So the fact that Hamilton's variational principle 
is independent of the coordinate system has some philosophical as well as mathematical advantages. Now the way we'll think about these is that Hamilton's variational principle and Newton's second law, which is the Euler equation for Hamilton's principle, we'll talk about them as if they're equivalent, the variational and differential forms of our equations. Now one thing you'll notice about the variational form and the differential form, and this has been true all throughout our discussion thus far, is the fact that there are some subtle differences. We talk about them being equivalent to each other, but there are some important subtle differences. So if you think about the differential form, so that's our Euler equation, this is a local law. Local in the sense that it's a differential equation that applies at every point individually, locally, within the domain. Whereas the variational form of Hamilton's principle or any other variational principle is posed as a global law. It's enforced across the entire, it's integrated across the entire domain of the system, whether that's a time domain and or a spatial domain. So they are equivalent mathematically, but there are some of these subtle differences. And that's partly why I keep emphasizing how this global variational form often can lead to additional insight or a better intuitive understanding of these physical principles as compared to solely looking at the differential form. So this is true even though the local differential form is often the one that will solve whether analytically or numerically to actually get the solution. So far we've been imagining Hamilton's principle is applied to a single order one sized object. Obviously in many systems we have more than one object and so we need to be able to deal with that. So let's imagine a system with capital N rigid particles or point masses. To get the T you simply add up the T, the kinetic energy, for each one. So that's the one-half mv squared for each of the objects. Same thing with the potential energy V. You just simply sum them up so you get the Vs or the f dot delta Rs associated with each object. So just add up the Ts, add up the Vs, and that will form your Lagrangian, as we'll see. Now you also have to be aware of the number of degrees of freedom. So capital N will be the number of discrete objects in this case and little n will be the number of degrees of freedom. So for example, if capital N were one, so I just have one object moving around in 3D space, then the number of degrees of freedom would then be three. The number of degrees of freedom is the minimum number of dependent variables required to fix the state or give the state of the system. So one object moving in three dimensions would require x, y, and z. There's another interpretation of Hamilton's principle, that's the principle of least action. It actually precedes Hamilton's principle and goes back to Maupertuis, who was a student of Johann Bernoulli back in the 16 and 1700s. So you still hear this terminology used today. So let me just mention it briefly. S, that's the integral of the Lagrangian, that is known as the action integral. And then Hamilton's principle is sometimes referred to as the principle of least action. I prefer not to use this terminology by calling it least action implies a minimum, and we now know that that's often not the case. So I will always refer to Hamilton's principle, but if you ever hear this terminology or reference to least action principle, it's exactly the same thing. Now one thing you'll notice is that Hamilton's principle for conservative force fields is in a proper variational form. In other words, you can write the variation of the integral of your integrand capital F is equal to zero. So for conservative forces, Hamilton's principle is in a proper variational form. If you have non-conservative forces, then you have f dot delta r, and it's not possible to write it in the proper variational form. So finally, I just want to emphasize this point again. When we talk about conservation of energy in this context, we're talking about conservation of mechanical energy. And that has two components. There's the kinetic energy, which is the energy due to its motion as well as potential energy, which is the energy of the system due to its position in a force field, whether a gravitational force field, electrical force field, or whatever the case might be. And so when we refer to a non-conservative system, we're not saying that it does not conserve total energy. What we're saying is it does not conserve mechanical energy. So there may be some mechanical energy being lost to heat. So total energy is indeed conserved, but the mechanical energy by itself may not be conserved in the presence of non-conservative forces. So just be careful about that. I wish we would have come up with better terminology for these things, but that's what we're kind of stuck with. So what I'm going to show in the next video is I'm going to do three examples. The first two are really high school physics problems, but we're going to do them using Hamilton's principle. And what I want you to see is that we will get the equations of motion as you would in a high school physics class or dynamics class for these problems.
but we're going to do it using Hamilton's principle.